Coming up, while ships were stalled on the coasts, the ports of Indiana set records in 2021. 11 million tons of cargo made its way through the state's three ports last year. CEO Vonta Coda is here to explain the reasons behind the surge and prospects for more growth. And Carmel-based Aleo says it is seeing a bump in business from Fortune 100 companies to the U.S. military. Founder and CEO Brandon Fisher has details on creating interactive experiences without writing any code. Plus... You didn't have to worry about being called the N-word. And like I said, for me, it was just a life-saving thing. I just, it helped me to make it through it was once the heart of Bloomington's black social scene. Now it's at risk for redevelopment. A second look at the historic BG Pollard Lodge in this week's Endangered Indiana. Details stories and much more ahead on this edition of Inside Indiana Business. Hello and welcome to Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick. The COVID-19 pandemic has snarled the nation's supply chain, grinding ports, in some cases to a virtual halt. But it has been a different story in Indiana as st the state's three ports in Burns Harbor, Jeffersonville and Mount Vernon set records in 2021. Uh, what's driving the surge in shipping and can the ports sustain that momentum? For some answers, I'm pleased to welcome back to the show Ports of Indiana CEO Vonta Coda. And uh, Vonta, as always, welcome to the show. Gary, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm glad you invited me. Yeah, well, listen, we want to talk about record numbers last year and what's uh, behind that. But first of all, I, I think it is amazing, the economic engine that you don't think of Indiana, many people don't, as a shipping state. But yet it is a huge economic uh, engine, well over $8 billion in economic impact. Yeah, $8.2 billion of economic impact. And uh, again, most of us don't think of Indiana as a shipping state. But on any given year, the state is either 12 to 14 as far as state ranking for maritime tons. We looked, uh, we all saw the video and see the video of, of ships stalled off the coasts. Different story here. What are the dynamics uh, at play? I know shipping and, and logistics, very complicated, uh, uh, you know, science, if you will. What are the factors at play that led to these uh, big numbers at the ports of Indiana? Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. The people of Indiana, the Hoosiers uh, of our state are working and there are, um, we've got a 2.7% unemployment rate and we do what we do. Um, we make things, we grow things, we move things. Um, and people are uh, uh, needing more of the commodities that are produced here, you know, foodstuffs, um, uh, uh, steel related commodities. And that's really the heart of, of what we do. We service those customers. Yeah, yeah talk uh, about the mix of business because coal has always been a big, uh, big product and that's still important, but increasingly steel and parts uh, components for these big wind farms and solar farms. Talk about the mix of business you're seeing at the ports. Yeah, it's, it's a, a very important mix. Um, our, our big numbers have always been reliant upon coal. And as that has, has shrunk, um, although last year was a, a, a big year-over-year -year growth, the, the growth in our general commodities and our value-added commodities are really what's driving our, our current next-level type of uh, impact, and that's uh, ag products, foodstuffs, and uh, steel uh, processing. As you look going forward, uh, Vanta, again, overall a record. Burns Harbor in northwest Indiana, Jeffersonville uh, in southeast Indiana, each set uh, total records, all-time records for those locations. What's going to really be driving business at the three ports of Indiana? Again, um, we're looking for that first value add. So as Indiana continues its march towards uh, manufacturing uh, per capita dominance, um, those are very important things for us, and um, we'll be seeking to, to encourage people to come to our campus and leverage the assets that we're putting in. Here today, we just finished up 
uh, uh, a Tiger grant worth $24 million worth of infrastructure down south. We're halfway through um, uh, a fast lane grant up in Burns Harbor, which is another $20 million. And we've got an additional 10 to $12 million worth of infrastructure that's already on the books and planned. Yeah, a lot of activity uh, around the state at the three uh, ports. And Vonta, I want to ask you about this because several years ago, uh, Governor Pence, uh, you know, talked about uh, the interest in, in creating, building a fourth port. Now, there's been some movement on that that's kind of slowed a bit. Give us an update, uh, a fourth port, the potential for that uh, in uh, kind of that southeast region. Yeah, we're still looking for that perfect combination. Um, and what we really want to do for that uh, uh, when we get to, to a, 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 a good decision point is find something that has really meaningful economic impact for the long term uh, for that region. And that's kind of the, the goal as originally thought of, and it's still the goal today. All right, Vonta Coda, the CEO of the Ports of Indiana. Vonta, great to have you on the show. Congratulations uh, on those numbers. I know you'll be looking to top those uh, in the year ahead. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right. Well, season one of the Business and Beyond podcast is now in the books, and what a first year it was. More than 25,000 unique downloads. Thank you for listening. One of our most popular episodes, our conversation with longtime Indianapolis radio personality, Ben Davis High School graduate Christy Lee. She's been a fixture on the nationally syndicated Bob and Tom show since 1988. Christy has rubbed elbows with some famous celebrities uh, over the years, including Dolly Parton, Peter Frampton, and a couple of strange encounters with Ozzy Osbourne. He's very hard to understand. Tom and I got to be on stage with him at Market Square Arena, dressed as monks in these robes. And all we can both remember is the huge zit that was on his back, which was so disgusting. And then when he came here, the one time he picked me up in the parking lot. I have a picture of that somewhere. I don't know where it was. I don't know why, but he carried me around in the parking lot. He's a weird dude. <laughs> Just one of the interesting conversations on the Business and uh, Beyond podcast in season one. We'll kick, kick off season two in a big way here in just a couple of weeks. To check out all of our podcasts, go to InsideIndianaBusiness.com and click on the subscribe tab. The so-called new normal of working from home paying off in a big way for a Carmel tech startup. More on Aleo's virtual platform and why it's getting attention from Fortune 100 companies and the U.S. military. It's time to go inside innovation. Carmel-based Aleo says it has found a way to help virtual business meetings go from boring to amazing, thanks to some high-tech tools. Fortune 100 companies and the U.S. military using the virtual visual canvas and collaboration platform. Pleased to welcome to the show founder and CEO Brandon Fisher. Brandon, uh, welcome. As always, congratulations on now the launch. You want to scale, uh, scale the business, right? Thank you, Gary. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah, okay, let's talk about Aleo. I mentioned this, a virtual visual canvas, a collaboration platform. Give us, in layman's terms, what it's all about. Sure. Uh, well, if you recall, the last time we met, actually, I was focused on uh, an experience in, in a room on a large interactive display. Uh, the challenge with that was, uh, of course, you had to be in the room, physically present to experience it. Um, if you wanted to attend virtually or remotely, you had to do it through a video conference type interface. Um, and it was your, your, your ability to truly participate was limited. So with Aleo, we're basically bringing that kind of experience, but making that available to every user on any device, um, nothing to download. And so we're basically, like you said, providing this this shared virtual uh, visual canvas where users can place any type of content, any type of content, images, video files, documents, um, you can use it as a whiteboard. You can also place live content, live application right from your desktop into this space. You can then invite remote users into this space to collaborate with you. Uh, we can seamlessly switch between modes like we're having now, conversation to one of us maybe sharing our screen, you know, traditional formats like that, but instantly switch to a more equitable experience where we're all contributing. 
and collaborating in real time. And I know, I know a key element of this too, uh, Brandon, is you can do this and, and without writing, uh, the user can do it without writing any code. Correct. Uh, it's, a, it's a codeless experience, exactly. Drag, drop. The ability, in, in fact, to, to insert, uh, really to, to kind of create somewhat of a, uh, your, your own experience, whatever, however you'd like that to work, to be able to drag and drop and insert, uh, create actions within the space um, that can, exactly, uh, just yeah. moments of engagement for users, uh, really. Yeah, um, you, you launched in 2019. You've had customers in the U.S. military, some Fortune 100 uh -huh. companies, so some, some big companies as well. Now you are uh, launching, you really want to scale things now. Talk about your vision for the business now. First of all, how it was received uh, by those uh, early customers and your vision for the business going forward. Sure. So, yeah, we really, um, we've been in market uh, since November of 2019, chose to take a different approach this time and uh, focus all of our time and attention on, a, on select few customers and their use cases. Uh, we really felt that, uh, in fact, just this, uh, this past Wednesday, February 2nd, uh, we launched. Uh, we're ready to bring it to the world. Um, and so, yeah, so we have, uh, we have an aggressive uh, growth plan over the next 12 months, uh, scaling in a number of different ways, but definitely growing our sales and marketing team. Uh, customer success is always a very important component because this is a new way of working that um, many users just haven't experienced before. Yeah, so we only have 20 seconds, Brandon, but I assume you want to ride, uh, ride that wave of these virtual meetings that are going to be with us uh, uh, forever, really. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think the dust is going to settle uh, anytime soon. I think that uh, we're realizing that, um, yeah, that it's actually possible for us to not only meet and connect remotely, like video conference yep. tools provide, but truly yep. come together and, and actually be more productive and get work done. All right, Brandon Fisher, the uh, CEO, the founder of Aleo. Brandon, thanks for joining us. Good luck going forward. Gary, thank you so much, Gary. All right. All right. Well, Visit Indy CEO Leonard Hoop says he's optimistic that tourism recovery will continue in 2022 following a strong recovery in the tourism sector last year. During this week's annual State of Tourism, Hoops said the NCAA's Men's Basketball Championship a Tournament, March Madness, that took place last spring, the College Football Playoff National Championship last month, served as bookends to that recovery. Big conventions helped too, including Gen Con, Performance Racing Industry, the National FFA Convention, and Sweets and Snacks Expo. From the outside, it doesn't look like much now, but back in the day, it was a go-to place for African-Americans in Bloomington during the racially charged 60s. Mary Rachel Redman on why this piece of Monroe County uh, history could soon disappear as she continues her Endangered Indiana series. Here's what's making news now around Indiana. Well, the long vacant BG Pollard Lodge was once a beacon of pride for Bloomington's black community. Today, it's a potential target for new development. Around Indiana, reporter Mary Rachel Redman recaps the history of this rare African-American landmark and takes us inside the building for the first time in over a decade. The Ku Klux Klan. The government was intended to be of the white man, by the white man, and for the white man. Mongrel class of people. In 1968, the Klan wanted to march here in Bloomington. The black market was burned on Kirkwood. On the levee, there were several rest, restaurants and bars, places that I shouldn't, shouldn't go to, you know, that uh, the local individuals uh, hung out in. And so it was kind of iffy if you if you went in there, you would end up, you know, probably getting your head knocked off. But there was one safe haven to socialize on the west side. All cities have this particular residential area. In Detroit, they call it... Have been a place to go and enjoy myself. And it was one of the places that welcomed uh, black folks. It may not look like much now, but during its heyday in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, 1107 West 7th Street was once the epicenter of Bloomington's black social scene. <laughs> 
finished in 1950, the BG Pollard Lodge started out as just a single basement. As it became more popular, it earned the nickname, The Hole. On the weekends, that's where you would find me, at The Hole, you know. The first time I went, what'd you think? I had dinner there, I had chitlins, or KYs. They had a DJ, you could dance. Played card games and, you know, listen to music, shoot the breeze, tell a lot of t tales. The whole was a place for the black community, IU community, city community. So even IU folk knew this is where you can come and you can just relax and be you. Jean Devane, originally from North Carolina, came to Bloomington in the early 60s, befriending a then relatively unknown entrepreneur by the name of Phil Cook. He would go on to work as vice president of Cook Medical's biggest sales division, and thanks to Devane and other young black professionals, the whole got a first floor. With a little bit of my influence, I was able to get funding. We were able to get a, a community project uh, center there. We hired local people uh, to do uh, community things, and, and it was, as I say, very, very successful. But the prosperity wouldn't last. We had a little kickback from the local black folks. We ended up losing because we were voted out. That started a downfall of the whole. The BG Pollard Lodge began its rapid decline in the 90s before being sold in 2006. Gutters. The buyer is a longtime Bloomington resident. He was nice enough to give us a tour when we were in town. Mm -hmm. But yeah, come on in, come on in. We come in that door yeah. and we head down these stairs. Yeah. And this this was historically the hole. This right? was the hole there, then there was that bar. The bar to the left. That was where the uh, pool table used to be. Pool table was here? Yeah. And I'm assuming, and then, is, this, is this the dance floor? And then the dance, <laughs> no, the dance floor, and yeah. The, dance, the dance floor would be right more or less where you are. Okay. Maybe not quite, maybe not quite that far. It'd be a little bit closer. Okay. And then the mirrors, the big mirrors the would mirrors be, used to be here. right there. So and one brought, can't help but notice the number of small things, items, you know. and in this case, big ones. This used to be the sign whispers of the people who once made this place come alive. The number of people that it served, not only uh, black folks, it was interracial, and I think it should be recognized. For, if, for no other reason for that, it was, uh, the, the, I won't say the starting of integration, but it was, it was part of. And the main thing is not to forget the history of that building. It, if it's not on a National Historic Site, it should certainly be recognized by the City of Bloomington as a City Historic Site, and that has not happened. They left a footprint here. Let's not forget what they did. Mary Rachel Redman, Inside Indiana Business. All right, Mary Rachel, thank you. Also making headlines this week around Indiana, the Allen County Fort Wayne Capital Improvement Board and county commissioners are looking into where money should be spent to improve the Allen County War Memorial Coliseum. The Journal Gazette reports Capital Improvement Board President James Cook wants to know where money should go, where it should be spent over the next two decades there. The arena section of the Coliseum is now some 70 years old. The CIB informally advanced a proposal to pay for a study, but did not provide a timeline for when it will be conducted. Over the next 10 years, projections show that microelectronics, that industry, will need about 100,000 new workers and more plants to make microchips and other advanced systems. Purdue professor Mark Lundstrom sees an opportunity for Purdue to fuel the microelectronics industry. That is quickly changing, and a global shortage of microchips is really just part of the puzzle. Lundstrom says Intel's decision to build a $20 billion microchip complex near Columbus, Ohio, could mean jobs for Purdue grads, grads and possible partnerships with institutions like Ivy Tech Community College. Well, he represented Indiana's first congressional district for more than 30 years. Now, Pete Visklosky has a new job. He's been named chairman of the Gary Chicago International Airport Authority. Visklosky succeeds Timothy Fesco, who served as chairman for three years. Ms. Klosky will serve a four-year term as chairman of the airport. Next, a toast to a growing new spirit in Indiana, Hoosier Distilleries, and uh, a look at what's driving the popularity of the state's whiskey and rye industry when we come back.
Well, 1205 Distillery was founded in 2014, and a lot has certainly changed since the Indiana Craft Distillery started making spirits, a mix of tradition and innovation. 1205 opened a tasting room in Indianapolis, another in Westfield, now planning to open a 15,000 square foot distillery and tasting room in downtown Lebanon. With more on growth plans and what's fueling the distilled spirits industry in Indiana, pleased to welcome 1205 distillery owner Nolan Hudson. Nolan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, great entrepreneurial story here, I think. A lot of, uh, of elements to it. Uh, I'll get right to it uh, first, though. This new location in Lebanon, downtown Lebanon, near the courthouse. This is a big move for you, not only a tasting room, but a big production facility as well. Talk about this new location and what it's going to look like in Lebanon. Yeah, so we're really excited to join uh, the Lebanon community. I've been in talks with the mayor and a uh, bunch of people involved for the past eight months or so. Um, and we're going to be opening up a 15,000 square foot distillery and tasting room. It's going to allow us to um, increase our production by about 400%. Uh, we're doing about a barrel and a half uh, of whiskey a week now. And we'll be making about a barrel a day uh, once we get into the full swing of things. Um, so we'll have half of it uh, set up for, dis uh, for distilling and the other half set up for a large tasting room um, with a music stage, bar, uh, and some food trucks inside. Yeah, that's phenomenal growth. Again, you launched in 2014 uh, in Fletcher Place in downtown Indianapolis, uh, expanded mm -hmm. to Westfield. Uh, talk about, in your view, how you got started, you know, and what's really driving uh, the growth uh, of your business? Yeah, we started um, strictly with production. We didn't have any of the room for a tasting room. So our first two years or so was just uh, distribution with our vodka and gin. We didn't have any of our whiskeys out. And then we opened up a tasting room, and the, our first tasting room just blew up. So then we decided to go into Westfield. And when we opened up Westfield, uh, we opened up about four weeks before the COVID shutdown. But even with then, um, just the community and people coming in and supporting us, we blew our first-year projections out of the water. And we realized that our growth in our tasting rooms is really going to help push our growth um, out in the market as well. So we really started to focus on our tasting rooms. We expanded our Westfield location once. We expanded our downtown location another time as well. And we decided we needed a bigger space to keep up with demand. Right now, we're selling faster than we can produce, yeah. um, especially with the tasting rooms. Yeah. So um, Lebanon was the next logical step for us. Uh, we found a perfect building. and. Um, yeah. Tasting rooms just really helped us grow to that point. Hey, Nolan, talk about the distilled spirits industry in Indiana. It's growing and has been growing. It's a little uh, tougher to uh, to enter the market, maybe more expensive than it is in the craft brewery uh, side of the business. But talk about the industry because it continues to grow, not just here in Indianapolis, but around the state. Yeah, for sure. We're seeing a lot more distilleries open up. Um, when we first started, there were just a handful of us, maybe five or six. And now we're seeing around 30 to 40 ones um, around the state. We're seeing a lot of breweries getting into the distilling game. Uh -huh. We're seeing a lot more people um, mm -hmm. just try to turn their hobby into uh, something almost like brewing, but it's a little harder because you're yep. not allowed to legally distill at home. Yep, yep. Um, so that's definitely a big barrier to entry. Only have about 20 seconds, Nolan, but I, I think it's interesting too. Craft breweries and also craft distilleries like 1205 can really be part of a community's uh, rebirth or quality of life, of uh, revitalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And we try to find those smaller cities that um, we see growth potential in and like Westfield and Lebanon, we know that we can um, help that community grow, but also that community is gonna help us grow um, because you know a lot of places want something like us or restaurants or breweries going in. Um, so That's very good. 1205 Distillery expanding again, this time into Lebanon with a major uh, uh, distillery. Nolan, Rich, or Nolan Hudson, I should say, the owner of 1205 Distillery. Nolan, congratulations on the growth. We look fo forward to following your story. Thank you so much. All right. Well, ahead in our next half hour, Saving Hoosier Lives, one transplant at a time. Details of the uh, Indiana Donor Network and its record year. It was really hard for me to carry a gallon of milk up three steps into the house. I was on oxygen uh, 24 hours a day. There's, there's no doubt in my mind without a transplant, I wouldn't be here today. 
Lance Lewis, alive today because of the gift of life given to him by Indianapolis police officer David Moore, gunned down in the line of duty. It was January 23, 2011, when Moore was shot three times during a traffic stop. He died three days later and donated his organs to seven people. Lance Lewis, one of those seven, the recipient of Moore's lungs. It all speaks to the importance of organ donation and the work of the Indiana Donor Network. The organization recorded another record year in 2021, increasing the number of transplants by an astonishing 43% over the past two years. The nonprofit says that translates to saving the lives of more than 800 people. Business of Health reporter Kylie Valletta has more Kylie. Thank you, Gary. The Indiana Donor Network says it transplanted 949 organs last year. That's the highest number in the nonprofit's 34 year history. Kelly Tremaine is president and chief executive officer and she joins me now to tell us more. Hi, Kelly, thanks for being on the show today. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, let's talk about those numbers first. It seems like every year the Indiana Donor Network outdoes itself uh, more transplants each year than the year prior. What's driving those numbers? Yeah, that's certainly our goal. We always want to transplant more organs than we have in years past. And um, first, I think it's just the generosity of, of Hoosiers in general. But we've made a lot of various changes over the last several years. Um, we've hired more staff than ever before, ensuring that we have people in hospitals capturing every possible opportunity. Um, our public ed education efforts have reached you know, millions of Hoosiers. And last year alone, we added 120,000 people to the uh, Indiana Donor Registry. So um, lots of hard work. You opened the in-house Organ Recovery Center in 2020. I know that was a really important addition to what you offer. Explain what that is and the impact that it's having. Yeah, so basically at our office, we have an ICU set up just like you would in a hospital, as well as operating rooms like you would in a hospital. So um, as we all know, the pandemic has really affected hospitals in ways that um, they have bed shortages, ventilator shortages, and it's been really difficult for families to even visit their loved ones when they're in the hospital. So by us having our own organ and tissue recovery center, we're able to transfer the patients from the hospital to our recovery center, care for them just like they would in any hospital setting, and then perform the entire donation process there. So it not only frees up the beds for the hospitals, but it allows families access to their loved ones in their last hours. So um, that's made a big impact on these families who otherwise may not even be able to spend much time with their loved ones at all in the hospitals given, given the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, such an important addition. So to keep up with those growing numbers, I know you've had to grow your staff throughout the state. So talk a little bit about that. And um, I know there are some open positions right now too. You're doing some more hiring. So talk a little we bit about are. that. We are, we're always hiring. And um, I, you know, I've started with the organization almost 22 years ago and we had about 40 or 50 employees. Now we're close to 300. Um, we've added close to 70 or 80 positions in the last two years. So we are really trying to focus on public education and education within the hospital system to make sure, like I said, that we capture every potential opportunity and that, you know, we're doing right for the people that are waiting on the transplant list. So I, we are still in the thick of the pandemic and that has impacted the medical industry in so many ways. How has the Indiana Donor Network been able to really thrive even during these really challenging times? Well, thankfully we have still had access to all of our hospitals. Our staff are all trained um, on the PPE that hospitals have, the, the wearing of the N95 masks. And so we've still been able to go in and have access to patients, but we've had to get really creative. Um, usually we go into schools and to health education classes when kids are around the sophomore, sophomore level and um, provide education about donation and transplantation at that time. And so with pandemic, we've not been able to go to schools like we used to. So we had to be creative and create online presentations. And same thing with hospitals, we've not been able to go and just do regular education. So we've had to do a lot of online education and just reaching people in different ways. And speaking of reaching people, there are more than 1000 Hoosiers on the national transplant, transplant waiting list now. And 
that really speaks to your mission, uh, your constant mission to get the message out about becoming a donor. So what do you want Hoosiers uh, to know about becoming a donor? Well, I think sometimes people think that they're too old or somebody might not want my organs. And the biggest message that I have is to just register yourself to be a donor. There's so many easy ways to do that. You can do that when you renew your license at the BMB. You can go online to donatelifeindiana.org. And now you can even register your decision when you get your fishing or hunting license. So don't ever rule yourself out as a potential donor. Let us make that decision at the time of your death. And you know, being able to carry on your legacy in life to other people, really, there is no greater gift. All right, Kelly, we only have about 30 seconds left, but you've been with the Donor Network for 22 years, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, just talk generally big picture, what kind of growth you've seen in over two decades with the Indiana Donor Network? Yeah, it's been pretty astronomical. Um, when I first started, I think we were facilitating about 300 transplants and now we're close to facilitating about a thousand transplants and so that's um, just amazing above and beyond and as I mentioned our staff has grown you know five six times fold from what it was when I first started so but we've also grown um, the Indiana donor registry and that's probably one of the most important pieces is that people have registered and um, made themselves donors so that's always a, a good thing. All right, Kelly, thanks for being on the show today. Congratulations on another successful year, and we'll probably talk to you next year. Yes, you will. Thank you. Gary, back to you. All right, Kylie, thank you. Well, big investment plans for Indianapolis-based Eli Lilly and Company. Lilly plans to invest more than a billion dollars to create a new manufacturing site in Concord, North Carolina, and $500 million in a new facility in Ireland. Lilly says the North Carolina plant will create about 600 jobs for scientists, engineers, and manufacturing personnel who will use advanced technology to produce treatments and devices. In 2020, the company announced a nearly half-billion-dollar investment in Durham, which is also in North Carolina's Research Triangle Park. Lilly also plans to invest $500 million in a new biopharma manufacturing facility in Limerick, Ireland. time now for Eye on Education. You know, it's been a challenging uh, or a challenge over the years for Indiana's largest school district to get more teachers from diverse backgrounds into the classroom. IPS is tackling the challenge uh, head on in a new innovative way uh, through a program called Proving What's Possible. There's a lot in it for educators, including paid residencies uh, and for IPS, which hopes new salary hikes for teachers will make the district uh, one of the most attractive in the entire country. For more on proving what's possible, the initiative, pleased to be joined by IPS Director of Talent and Acquisition, Alex Mosman. And Alex, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Gary. It's great to be here. Proving what's possible. This is a big initiative and a big effort uh, on the part of IPS. Give us a thumbnail description, uh, description of really what this is all about. Yeah, really, it's about making sure that as a district, we're providing a lot of pathways for folks to uh, become employed in the district and retain in the district, and specifically with the focus on making sure that we are uh, reflecting the diversity of our student population and our staff population. So increasing the diversity of staff, uh, both at the teaching ranks, at the leader ranks, and across staff as well. How, how do you do it? Give, give us an idea, maybe of some of the, uh, the elements uh, of this initiative that, that you hope are gonna, you're gonna keep people in the district, but also attract, uh, attract some new faces in as well. Yeah, so two of the initiatives that we're launching under Proving What's Possible, the first is the Indie Teach Apprenticeship, which is a, a program that was piloted out of, of Crystal House, which we're bringing into the district to grow and expand. Um, and, th and that's really going to decrease a lot of the barriers to the teaching field that we see uh, across the landscape, but specifically ones that impact diverse populations. Uh, so that's one of the ways in which we're hoping to attract and retain more diverse teacher candidates. And then we're also launching the IPS Principal Residency, which is the only district in the state uh, uh, currently to have a principal residency and so hoping again to build that strong bench of leaders who are ready to step into a school leadership position uh, long term and, and, and continue to drive results for students. And really I think it's in interesting to note uh, that you really feel that this is really building upon what has been some success in the talent uh, attraction and retention uh, game there at IPS. There have been some positive developments over the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we have the start is hiring, start is hiring, Start is 
Highest starting. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Got Highest it. Highest starting teacher salary in Indiana. Uh, we have the largest teacher leadership program in the state, and uh, we have a 12% increase in teacher retention over the last four years. Yeah, and, and part of how, how much of it, uh, Alex, too, is um, awareness. Uh, what you just mentioned there, uh, and j just the fact making people aware of uh, of those elements and, and and what's available and what it's like to work in IPS, that awareness issue. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the pieces that we're really excited about here with proving what's possible is the opportunity to make sure that we're continuing to not only decrease the barriers to the profession, but we're decreasing the barriers for folks to really engage and celebrate their work in the district. And so we started with some small internal pieces and, and we're excited to continue to uh, roll some new initiatives out throughout the rest of the school year as well. Yeah. How, how, how wide uh, is the net you're going to be throwing out there? I mean, uh, certainly I imagine you're looking around the state of Indiana, but uh, is this a nation? nationwide uh, initiative? So I think our focus really is going to be on kind of owning our backyard, having a really strong presence here in Indianapolis initially. Uh, and then when we feel like we've got that right, then I think you, you definitely can look for us to, to grow and expand across the Midwest and certainly nationally as well. Yeah. How about metrics? What is What will success of this uh, initiative look like? So we're, we're tracking closely on the number of diverse applications received, the number of diverse hires, uh, but also really importantly is, is the retention of staff over time as well. So continuing to see those metrics rise, they've risen uh, every year for the last two years. Uh, and so hoping that we continue to see that progress over time, but also just anecdotally, as we think about the, the trajectory of the campaign, long-term, uh, not just five years, but 10 years out, when you ask folks what's a great place to work in Indianapolis, we wanna be part of that uh, answer. We want to be in that list of places that folks think that Indianapolis Public Schools is a great place to work. Yeah, and a final uh, question for you, and you kind of answered it there because I was curious about uh, the vision here and, and, and how long of a term uh, this might be. It sounds like this is not a one or two year deal. You, you're looking at this initiative with a, a longer lens. Absolutely. I mean, for all the challenges that COVID presented, we want to make sure that as with our talent strategy, we are taking this opportunity to be bold and aggressive uh, with a strategy that's going to meet this moment, but also set the district up for success, uh, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. Proving what's possible, a new teacher recruitment and retention initiative at Indianapolis Public Schools. Alex Mosman, the director of talent and acquisition at IPS. Very interesting uh, initiative, and we'll look forward to following its progress in the coming months. Thanks, Gary. All right. Well, up next, a trip down memory lane uh, when the eyes of the world were focused squarely on Indianapolis, the site of Super Bowl 46. Will the city bid on another one? And what's next in terms of that potential next big thing? We'll take a look when we come back. With Super Bowl 46 in Indianapolis in 2012, we were center stage. All eyes were on Indiana. Indiana's own Jane Pauley describing one of Indiana's biggest shining moments on the global sports stage. Well, it has been a decade since Indianapolis hosted the NFL's crown jewel. And next, we recall that uh, momentous occasion with the leader of that unprecedented effort as we go inside Indiana sports with Bill Benner. Bill. Gary, thanks. Five years of planning, 8,000 volunteers and staff, unmatched ingenuity, and yes, some unlikely good weather, led to one of the, if not the most Super Bowls in history, certainly one of the best. And today we're joined by the person who served as president of the Super Bowl host committee, Allison Melanchthon, for a look back and perhaps a look ahead to the possibility of doing it all over again. And we welcome Allison, who now serves as senior vice president for Penske Entertainment. Allison, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Well, it, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years, but uh, as we recall that week, and everything that led up to it, five years of preparation, uh, it really, in retrospective, couldn't have gone off any better. You know, it was an absolutely fabulous 10 days. And, you know, we debated on and on, should we keep it to five days or should we extend it, make it the longest Super Bowl experience ever? We went with the 10 days. Uh, we were blessed with the weather. Uh, we were able to entertain over a million people in, in downtown in that period. And everything went really well. You, uh, you put out some information on, on Facebook today, 1.1 million visitors to the village. I mentioned 8,000 volunteers, 150,000 volunteer 
hours and so many interesting touches. The zip line, I mean, everybody remembers the zip line. <laughs> super, super scarves, I believe you have. I do, super, I have my uh, super scarf right here. Got, uh, super <laughs> scarf. Uh, youth initiatives, the, the Chase Near East Side legacy. It was, it was, again, as we always do, far more than just a football game. Yeah, our focus from day one, when we went after the Super Bowl, uh, from a leadership perspective, we said this is way bigger than the game. The NFL will actually be able to control everything that happens on the field. And we've got to make this different for Indiana and Indianapolis and make make it a differentiator for this city and this state that people will always remember the things that really mattered, the things that carry on in legacies, the way it impacts people. Certainly, it had a huge economic impact. Uh, and as we sit here 10 years later, um, I know I'm, I'm still super proud of this effort that the city put in because I see people all the time that, that bring it up and say it to me. I saw Mike Tirico this year at the Indy 500, and he said has never been a Super Bowl like Indianapolis. And, of course, there were NFL concerns of, about bringing the game to Indianapolis, whether this whole concept of this village and a compact area would work. And uh, they did it so well that they ended up rewriting the manual <laughs> after Indianapolis hosted the game. Yeah, what a compliment, right? So many of the things we did, the NFL put into bid specs and other cities called us later and said, how did you do that? We want it, we want to do it. Uh, and it was a bit of a convincing process to the NFL. You're absolutely right uh, to centralize everything because they had Miami in their background. They had Phoenix in their background of Super Bowls that, that everything was really spread out. So we, we just like Indianapolis always does, we started a brand new trend and a brand new industry related to this sort of nucleus for Super Bowls. Allison, as we look ahead, uh, two things. One, a, a very important bill to the entire Indianapolis Sports Initiative is working its way through the state legislature that would create a fund that would help bid these uh, uh, attraction of great sporting events. And two, could that weigh into the fact, uh, and as it become a big factor, in Indianapolis pursuing another Super Bowl? Let's do do it again. Yes, absolutely. This is an important advancement for us, and, and, I, and I know it's going to go well for us, but the, the market is competitive across the country. Indiana, Indianapolis started the first sports commission in 1979, and now there's over 500 of them. This is big business. This is competitive, and uh, to get a bill like this pushed through is going to be very, very good for us going in the future for other events, and then certainly if we look at another Super Bowl, it's going to be very important. Uh, as we close, Allison, uh, putting on your Pinsky Entertainment role, a uh, big announcement last week from Pinsky Entertainment. Force Indy now has a full-time driver, Ernie Francis Jr., to get into Indy Lights, hopefully into the Indy 500, and a very important uh, aspect uh, moving forward for representing minorities in right. auto racing at the highest level. Yeah, this was an important initiative for us with Roger Penske and Penske Entertainment in our, under our Race for Equality and Change banner. Ernie is going to be a fabulous driver. They're moving up uh, to Indy Lights this year with the goal in the next couple of years to get uh, Force Indy, the, the name of the team, into the Indy 500. So it's a great advancement for us, and we're really excited for Ernie. Well, Allison, we can't appreciate uh, any more that you coming on the show, looking back at 10 years, and hopefully in the next 10 years, We'll have continued great successes, including maybe a, a Super Bowl. Let's do it, do it again. Allison, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. All right. And Gary, back to you. All right, Bill, thanks uh, for a great look back at a big uh, event in Indianapolis history. Well, one of the biggest voices in Indiana sports struck a chord among those who listened to the first season of the Business and Beyond podcast. You probably know him as JMV, but this Greene County native grew up as John Michael Gleva. He's hosted the popular afternoon drive radio show, The Ride with JMV, since 2010. As we look back on our first season and prepare for season two of the podcast, we take a look at our conversation conversation with JMV in October and why growing up in small town Indiana is still near and dear to his heart. One general store, one in town post office, um, a uh, August celebration called um, Founders Day when the town was founded, riding bikes all over the place, finding a backyard to play baseball in, a little two on two, three on three, baseball, pitcher's hand, a full court basketball, playing basketball all the time. 
Um, well, I grew up, I was lucky enough to, to grow up with a, a pool. We were the only one around that had an in-ground pool. So everybody ended up over at our house all the time, riding motorcycles all the, I mean, I live, my mom still lives there too. We have 40 acres that butts right up against Crane. The general store stuff was great because I mean, it was straight out of Little House on the Prairie because the layman's general store not only had, you know, food and they had the, the, the lift up coolers where you got 16 ounce glass bottles out of, I mean, there was nothing like like that but they also they had like uh work wear and active wear and boots and because back before you know way back when when owensburg was founded obviously in the uh the late 1800s or whatever that was the only place to go around where you could shop so uh they they it had everything and i wouldn't have traded those memories for the world because it was incredibly outstanding i love my high school i love eastern green i love it better as eastern high school and not eastern green but i love eastern green uh, um, i still have uh, a ton of friends around there if i really want to feel comfortable and kind of cut loose that's where i go uh, with your friends down there. Um, not to say that I, I love having friends up here as well, but it's just it's just a different level of comfort that you have. It's like a big family. To check out JMV and the other 51 conversations we had during season one, where we also had more than 25,000 unique downloads, check out the Business and Beyond podcast. All of those episodes, episodes at InsideIndianaBusiness.com. Click on the subscribe tab. Some 25,000 unique downloads in season one. We're preparing to launch season two in a big way within the next couple of weeks. A global icon with an indelible Indiana connection, our first guest. Well, our partners at the Indianapolis Business Journal also reflecting back on the importance, the impact of Super Bowl 46 in Indianapolis, including a look at what happens to all those murals installed around the city 10 years ago. Details when we come back. Well, what is the gig economy and how is it moving forward in Indiana? Also, what's next for the 46 murals installed in Indianapolis when the city hosted the Super Bowl a decade ago? Our partners at the IBJ are looking into this and a whole lot more. And for a look at what's ahead in this week's edition, pleased as always to be joined by IBJ editor Leslie Wyden-Benner. Leslie, welcome. Thanks, Gary. I always appreciate being on. Yeah, I, uh, you know, a story I didn't mention, which I think is a, a really interesting story that Mickey Shuey uh, has a piece on this week, and that's the Intel uh, decision. Ohio won that mega uh, project, $20 billion uh, microchip uh, processing and manufacturing facility, a huge win, thousands of jobs. And I know Mickey's going to be taking a look at, at how Ohio got it, and I guess more specifically, what Indiana did or didn't do that maybe it should have. And, you know, Gary, this is the latest kind of mega deal, which we can consider anything that's over a billion dollars mm -hmm. uh, to land someplace other than Indiana. And so what Mickey's taking a look at and Emily Ketterer has a, a story to go with this as well, is what is the legislature doing? How are they reacting? And they are working on legislation that would change Indiana's incentive structure and give the IEDC a little more flexibility and maybe even a little more money to try to make, try to attract some of these big deals. Yeah, and, and you know, when, when things like this happen, you lose out on one of those big deals, especially to a neighbor, it's kind of an eye opener uh, to be sure. Um, yeah, you know, Lilly just this week or just this week announced it was putting a huge plant in North Carolina. It's its second big investment in North Carolina. And so it's those kind of deals that make a huge difference. You know, these high tech manufacturing jobs, these are the kind of jobs that aren't remote, that people yeah. can't work from other places. And so these are really important projects. Yeah, a very good point on Lilly, too. A massive investment in Research Triangle Park. Uh, also, the gig economy, we hear a lot about it. Uh, it's moving up market, uh, I guess you could say, here in Indiana, the trend among startups to um, hire fractional executive. What's, what's that about? Yeah, that's a term that I was unfamiliar with until Susan Orr started working on this story. And, you know, we think of gig workers as the people delivering food or driving Ubers, but lots of companies need, for example, a really good CFO or maybe a really good marketing officer, but they're just not big enough to hire a full-time person. And so what fractional employment allows is for the company to hire someone for maybe 12 hours a week or 20 hours a week on contract 
And then that person can then also work at another company. And so mm-hmm. it it has benefits, some drawbacks, but it has benefits for both sides. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, final story, uh, and this is an interesting one too, those 46 murals that were installed in Indianapolis for Super Bowl 46, 10 years ago now. A lot of uh, reflection on uh, what transpired then, what's next. These murals are kind of at the end of their, their lifespan, right? They are, they were meant to last 10 years. And so that's where we're at now. And so the Indie Arts Council is looking at those, you know, of the murals, there are a few that are already gone, but they're looking at the ones that are left and deciding which one should we, should we maintain. For example, Kurt Vonnegut on Mass Ave, that mural is not going anywhere. That has become a key part of that neighborhood and really important. But there are others, so they're talking to the artists, to the building owners and others about how, whether they should be maintained and then how they're gonna raise the money to do it. Uh, be interesting to see what is next for those uh, murals. Leslie Weidenbinner uh, from the Indianapolis Business Journal. As always, great to have you on the show. Look forward to seeing you soon. Great, thanks a lot, Gary. All right. Well, a fifth straight record-breaking year for economic development in Indiana. The Indiana Economic Development Corporation reporting nearly 300 companies announced commitments to locate or expand in Indiana last year with more than $8.7 billion in planned capital investment. That's a 56% increase over the previous year. Among the larger job commitments, Toyota Motor Manufacturing uh, Indiana in Princeton, where the company has announced uh, an $800 million expansion, which could create up to 1,400 jobs over the next uh, year or so. The report also details some major capital investment commitments, including the $1.5 billion Mammoth Solar Project in Stark and Pulaski counties, which broke ground in October. The state says the average hourly wage increased to $28.49. And businesses detailed plans. These are commitments for 31,710 jobs last year. And I'll be right back after this. Coming up next week, Yelp's Brittany Smith with the 2022 trends for food and drink in Indiana. Plus, Mary Rachel Redmond takes us to downtown Newcastle in the latest uh, edition of her Endangered Indiana series. Thanks for joining us. I'm Gary Dick. Go out and make it a successful week.